Okay, uh, today I'll discuss two main examples, which are maybe the most famous, like the isoperimeric inequality. And the sobol of inequality. And everything more or less will revolve around them. So they're very famous, but let me recall them in any case. So you have a set in Rn, and you want to bound the volume with the furniture. And up to scaling, you have more or less only one choice, which is in fact the isoperimeric inequality. Similarly here, you have a function. And instead of the perimeter, you have the Dirichlet energy. I'll talk about the L2, L2 star, so we'll have inequality. And here, instead of the volume, you have a certain mass, which is the L2 star. And two star is the only exponent which makes sense uh, because of homogeneities. Okay, uh, these are very well studied. So for example, we know uh, the optimal constant Cn, we know the optimal, um, the optimal sets and the optimal functions. So what are the optimal sets and optimal function, which I'll call minimizers? Here, uh, they are just Euclidean balls. Here, uh, they are, the family of talented bubbles. Talented bubbles have an explicit formula, but it's not important here. Uh, what you should keep in mind is that they are radial uh, and they are decreasing and they are not complex supported. So the profile goes something like this. Okay. Then uh, there's one last thing that I want to recall about uh, both inequalities, which are uh, the Euler Lagrange equation associated. So uh, you have two inequalities. You can easily associate a functional to the inequalities, just moving everything on the same side. And once you have a functional and you want to study the minimizers, it makes sense to compute the derivative. And this is what I call uh, Euler Lagrange equation. So uh, the stationarity condition. Here uh, it's h up to scaling h equal to one. This is the mean curvature of the boundary. Uh, similarly, here uh, you get a critical elliptic equation. So I've said that the minimizers are classified. In fact, even critical points are classified uh, under some restrictions, uh, but these are technical and just keep them. So here, once again, you get that the only solutions are balls. And here, uh, if you restrict to positive functions, you get that the only critical points, so solutions of this critical elliptic equation are talented bubbles. Okay, uh, now I can move on and discuss uh, what I mean with stability. Stability is the fact that if you have something which is almost a minimizer for these inequalities, you expect it to be close to a real minimizer. But uh, today I'd like to discuss something a bit more specific, which is sharp quantitative stability. Uh, instead of giving examples, uh, I think it's best to, uh, now instead of explaining what sharp and quantitative mean in general, I give the two examples in these two cases. So I'll start with the statement and then I'll discuss them. Uh, so this is a celebrated theorem by Cusco Maggio and Fratelli in 2008. And so what you want is to make the isoperimeric inequality quantitative. So you take the the isoperimeric ratio the isoperimeric inequality tells you that this quantity is greater or equal than zero but in fact you'd like to say that this quantity controls your distance from the minimizers which are balls and in fact this is exactly the statement so 
what I write here, it's a distance from the set of balls. So you take the infimum over all balls of this distance. <clears throat> An appropriate power. Uh, so this is sharp in the sense that this exponent cannot be improved. Here, this is the symmetric difference. So you are taking uh, the measure of the symmetric difference. And of course, you can optimize over the ball. Uh, this was quite a breakthrough. It was open for a long time. And there were partial results before with uh, worse exponents. Then this was proven again. Uh, what what does that in the inequality, what does a little tilde under the inequality mean? Uh, there is a universal constant here. Uh, what I've here written with CN, I should repeat it everywhere, but I'm just using the tilde. Uh, okay, this was repeated and no one is actually able to identify the constant, but that's a different topic. So this was, the proof was repeated and a bit generalized by Figali Maggi Pratelli with optimal transport methods. Then it was proven again uh, with a completely different method by Cicalese and Leonardi. And then it was proven again for a much wider class of inequalities uh, by Leonora Cinti, uh, Ami, Aldo Bratelli, Xavier Don, and Joachim Serra. And uh, at the very end, we start from a proof of the superimeric inequality due to Cabré, which is wonderful. And if I have time at the very end, it's online, I'd like to show it. But first, uh, what's the situation on the other end for the sovereign inequality? We have this theorem, which is comparably easier uh, with respect to the uh, isoperimeric inequality. This is due to Bianchi Egnel, 91. And as you'll see, the statement is exactly what you would expect. Uh, so you take the Sobolev ratio. Uh, the Sobolev inequality tells you that this is greater or equal than zero. Uh, but they're able to say that this controls a distance uh, to talenti bubbles in a very strong norm, in fact. As you see, the flavor is exactly the same. Um, let me mention that in some sense here, the proof is by nowadays considered standard and similar methods can be applied to obtain uh, sim a similar stability result for other inequalities. Okay. So more or less, this closes uh, the questions for the sharp quantitative stability of minimizers. But then one can ask himself the same questions, stability, yeah, for critical points. So the question here, at least qualitatively, is if I'm almost solving the euler lagrange equations, am I close to a critical point, which happens to be minimizers? Uh, this time I leave much more space for the Sobolev case, uh, and to, it will be clear why. So, uh, in the Sobolev setting, one may conjecture. Uh, let's say if I am almost a solution of the Euler Rangard equation, which is to say that this is small, then possibly you is close to a talenti bubble. Uh, the answer to this question is more or less easily no, because just if you take two talenti bubbles, which are very distant in the space, and you sum them, you'll get something which satisfies this, but of course, it's not close to a talenti bubble. Sorry, uh, yes, I don't you have to restrict to uh, positive? Yes, I do have. Uh, this is something that here I have completely omitted, but every, more or less everywhere. Like here, I'm saying that one can really say just easily that the only solutions of these are, are uh, talented bubbles, but this is false. Um, like there are sign changing solutions, there are infinitely many, not, not so very well understood. Exactly, yes. More or less everywhere. But in some sense, studying the sobol of inequality. It's rather natural to restrict to uh, positive functions. Sure. Anyway, 
I think it. Um, so uh, this is false, but maybe one can guess, maybe to a sum of talenty bubbles. This could be true, at least more true than before. And this was made a theorem qualitatively uh, by Struve uh, in I84. And what's the statement of this theorem? Once again, the statement is very natural. There are some technical condition I will skip. One of them is the positivity. And what you get is that if this quantity And here, the natural norm to consider is uh, h minus one, because you are taking the norm of a differential. Uh, if this is small, non-quantitatively, so here you have to put a modulus of continuity, then this controls the distance between you and the sum of talented bubbles. Uh, S sum of talented bubbles. And this is purely qualitative, obtained by compactness. Uh, and before getting to something quantitative, uh, uh, we need to wait a bit. And uh, the quantitative version uh, was done by uh, me and Alessio. Uh, and more or less, but only in low dimension. If three, if the dimension is between three and five, then we can remove omega. And the result is sharp. Like we just remove omega and this is sharp. Like you cannot put exponents anywhere, it would become false. But this is true only in dimension between three and five. And in the paper, in fact, we proved that it's false in higher dimension. <laughs> to get something in higher dimension, uh, we have to wait for uh, then soon and vibe. I don't know if I think it's still a preprint that uh, in dimension greater or equal than six, uh, let's say seven, then one can put omega equal to t to alpha n, and they can identify the sharp exponent. And for dimension equal to six, there are logarithms appearing, uh, but they are able to detect them. Okay, so in some sense, also the sharp stability, the sharp quantity stability for critical points is closed for the so of inequality. Uh, it remains just to wonder. The, the, just, the only missing piece is the same result for the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, that is to say, if something almost solved this in a reasonable sense, then it's close to a, to a ball, this would be false. Close to a collection of balls, uh, qualitatively we know this, but any, there, there is no sharp quantitative uh, result in the correct norms. So here, uh, this is in some sense the only missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Okay. And I'd like to, to use literally the last two minutes uh, to show something which is not mine. Uh, this is uh, a one-line proof the supernumeric inequality uh, due to Cabrera. This is what we used. In this work here, in this work here, we prove the stability for a wide range of isoperimeric inequalities. But that's not why I want to show it to you. I wanted to show it to you because it's wonderful and it was used recently uh, by Simon Brandel to prove uh, an isoperimeric inequality in co-dimension one. And as you'll see, the proof can be, can be given in the last two minutes of a talk. So you take a set E, and normalizing, you may assume that the volume is equal to the perimeter. It is easy to, to obtain. And therefore, this guarantees that you can solve the following system. This is analysis two. Okay. Then just using uh, the boundary conditions, one obtains that the gradient of u takes a lot of values. Uh, the precise statement, which is elementary to prove, this is an easy exercise, is that even if you restrict to the points where the action is positive, you still get the whole, the whole unit ball. So the whole unit ball is contained in the image of the gradient. And now, if, if you have seen the proof through optimal transport or through the note map of the isoperimetric inequality, uh, you, you can expect what is happening. Thanks to this, you can do a change of variable <laughs> and writing down the Jacobian, you will get that 
the integral over this set that I'll call <coughs> the tilde of the Jacobian uh, must estimate B1. But then, you know, you have a determinant, you have a condition on the Laplacian, it's very natural to estimate this using like uh, uh, the inequality between arithmetic mean and geometric mean. And you get Laplacian divided by n to the power n. Here you just replace e tilde with e. Here you replace Laplacian with one, because you know it, and you end up with this. And it turns out that this is exactly a supermetric inequality. Like under this constraint, uh, this is equivalent to the supermetric inequality, which is rather magical. If you don't believe it, because there are some numerology, there's some numerology going on, you can notice that everything is an identity. For, for the balls, so this must be the supernumeric inequality. And with this, I would conclude. Thank you very much for listening. In which um, way do you actually measure to, um, do you, would you like to measure somehow, say, if you, if you have to shoot a conjecture? Ah, uh, here. On the, on the. Yep. <laughs> How do you want to measure mm. being far from the oscillation? I mean, H and how would you uh, measure the oscillation? Well, the oscillation kind of looks natural, but, but H. Like something like this would be amazing. Using this in, a, in L2, or I mean, or there is in some sense the easy result, but maybe less interesting and it's less clear if there would be a sharp quantitative version, which makes sense a lot. It's in L infinity. Something like this here, you write down the boundary. And on the other end, one should really uh, take care of what kind of result he wants to obtain. Because, uh, I mean, in fact, that one would have two different results. Like, if you assume something like this, then you would expect to get tangent, a collection of tangent balls. Because it turns out that one can, in fact, produce uh, two tangent balls, uh, keeping the mean curvature close to one. On the other hand, here, you can even produce stuff and middle. You can even produce stuff like this, and many of these. So here, a tangent, and here, non-tangent. And you want to measure the symmetric difference of the set Possibly, yeah. between these guys? Correct. You cannot really open something much better, like at the level of the perimeter. Sure. But uh, what what is known is that this, with this norm, okay, here I might say something false, but with this norm, it's known qualitatively, and with this norm, is known quantitatively, but it's non sharp. Like no one believes that it's quantity sharp; it's just a random exponent. Qualitatively, you mean if that is close, I mean, yes. if that is small, you're close to a configuration like that. Indeed, and always there is always uh, some kind of estimate on the volume. Like here, I'm dropping some assumptions going on, but here you have you have to no in the, I don't know, twenty five B one, and here one has to do the same. Like you have to still keep uh, the energy bounded. Yes. After this, this, is, this, is, this is kind of an off the wall question. I've always worked in higher dimensions. So recently, I was starting by dimension two. And you have all this nice machinery. Can you ever, do you ever find any problem, a problem in dimension two that you can solve using it? Not, not that I can think of. <laughs> like the, the, the main issue, like whatever concerns the solve volume inequality, at least L2, L2 star, really yeah. breaks yeah, down yeah, in dimension yeah. two. Yeah. So uh, one. And I actually, I don't think that. There's really anything in dimension two for. I don't want to say something false, no, but the answer is sadly no. Oh, it's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> we have one machine. That's <laughs> zero. <laughs> well, but if you if you assume h minus one in L infinity in, in 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 two dimensions, that's like saying that's so strong, right? I mean, essentially yeah. the curve. Ah, oh, you mean this? Yeah, I mean. Ah, yeah. Then maybe it's doable. I don't know. I don't know if ah no yeah in two dimension that that is much much stronger yes uh, in two dimension I think that you cannot even have two tangent balls exactly indeed yeah exactly. but I guess this becomes like more or less elementary in two dimension yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Because everything is one dimensional here, it's more or less a second derivative. But I think you are uh, accurate. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that, that, that's morally correct, what yeah. would happen. Um, so, we have four minutes, thank you again.